Good morning. Wonderful to see you all. Welcome to those online as well. Now, um, just to prepare you for those in the building, we had a slight issue with the projector earlier. So if it should shut off, because it might overheat, then there is a reserve screen on the back wall. We might need to use that at some point. But, you know, we can pray that this, this one will keep being projected and we'll all be able to face forwards. Anyway, um, a warm welcome uh, if you're new to Longmeadow Evangelical Church. Uh, I'm part of the leadership team. My name is Ben Epps. It's great to see you all. Uh, we've come together to praise the Lord Jesus Christ and to increase our trust and our sight, our clarity of faith in him. And uh, John the Baptist was uh, rather clear about who Jesus is. I love this uh, simple sentence. Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It's strange to call this great king, this long-promised Messiah, the Lamb of God. It reminds us that time and again, God had set up this picture of sacrifice through the whole Old Testament, that animals would be killed in the place of people. But now here's the ultimate sacrifice, our king, in place of each one of us. You could take away our sins. That is really good news for each one of us. Well, we're going to stand and sing about this wonderful son and king and lamb who was to be slain for the sins of all the world. Let's stand and sing, God's saints of old. <laughs>
praise you, Lord Jesus Christ, that you love us so much. You laid down your life for us. And we praise you that you have the authority to take it up again. You are risen and reigning now. Hallelujah. As we remain standing, let's pray that all creatures of our God and King would praise his name. Please do take a seat. Well, it's not often um, we sing about all creatures falling on bended knee in submission to the Lord Jesus, but also in humility. And uh, we're going to say a prayer of confession together now. And if you're able, I can, can I invite you to join me on bended knee to the Lord Jesus Christ? We're going to kneel before the Lord Jesus. It's traditional in some churches to do this as they confess their sins. You can join me if you're able. Um, It's not essential, but it's just helpful to have a posture that reflects what we're saying to the Lord Jesus sometimes. We're going to pray a prayer of confession together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against others and against you, whether in our minds, words or actions. We have often done what is wrong and failed to do what is good. Sometimes we didn't know what we were doing, and sometimes we did it on purpose. We are truly sorry, and repent of all our sins. Your Son, Jesus Christ, died for us. Because of him, please forgive us all we've done. Help us to serve you in newness of life. To the glory of your name. Amen. There's wonderful promises of forgiveness in the Lord Jesus, and they're found even in the Old Testament. So Psalm 32 says, Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight. What joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of guilt. 
whose lives are lived in complete honesty. That's what happens when you are totally honest with the Lord and say, I have sinned. He's more than willing to forgive because Jesus is the Lamb of God who is slain for the sins of the world. So let's stand and praise this one who has shown such mercy that will never remember our sins again. Let's stand. standing and would one or two lead us in open praise of this merciful saviour. Praise him above you, heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. And thank you, Lord Jesus, you not only free us from the guilt of our sins, you free us from the power of sin too. By the power of your Holy Spirit, you enable us to walk more and more as you do. And we pray that as we worship your name and celebrate your goodness, your wise rule in our lives, we would see more of the fruit of the Spirit, that we would bring you glory. Amen. Amen. We're going to remain standing to sing a song that has a few actions. It's Who's the King of the Jungle? Are you ready? Hopefully the uh, laptop will... Uh, Play the music for us. Here we go. Uh, <laughs> Who's the king of the jungle? Who's the king of the sing bubble bubble bubble? Who's the king of the universe? And who's the king of me? I'll tell you, J E S U S. Yes, he's the king of me. 
He's the king of the universe, the jungle and the sea. Who's the king of the jungle? Who's the king of the sea? Bobble, bobble, bobble. Who's the king of the universe? And who's the king of me? I'll tell you. J E S U S. Yes, he's the king of me. He's the king of the universe, the jungle and the sea. It's a lovely thing to have joy as you praise the Lord Jesus Christ. There's nothing wrong with smiling and laughing because he is the most gracious king. And don't we want many more people to know Jesus as their king and saviour? Well, the Christmas journey is happening in lots of different primary schools uh, in Stevenage and in the region. And uh, we, it's only right that we should pray that these children and the teachers and the teaching assistants and various staff that come along will hear and listen up to the true story of Christmas as they hear about the arrival of our Saviour and that they'll put their trust in him. So um, I think, um, I was going to say pray in small groups, but we're just going to pray as, as a whole now. I'll lead us in prayer. Father, we thank you so, so much for the Christmas journey, for the many times that children across Stevenage have heard the good news through this wonderful initiative. We pray that as lots of classes of primary school children come to hear the good news these, these weeks ahead, that they would listen up, that you would open their eyes and their hearts to realize Jesus is the kindest Savior, the one we all need. Now we pray that the teachers and the TAs would learn about Christ and want to teach about him more, uh, that it won't simply be a one-off through the year, but that Jesus will feature in their religious instruction from here on. And Lord, we thank you for those who are coordinating in the different churches. Please help them. Give them wisdom so that it would run smoothly. Pray that the volunteers will be united and have great joy as they uh, play the parts of different Christmas characters. Uh, help them to be, do it clearly that uh, the true message of Christmas will come across. And we pray that um, as the weather is a bit unpredictable at the moment, you give safe travel for all as they go from their school to a local church and back again. Thank you, Lord, very much for the Christmas journey. Amen. Um, we're also going to pray for Chris and Sarah Power this morning. There they are, featured with their children, Izzy, Esme, Iris, and Sebi. Um, they work at Rift Valley Academy in Kenya, which uh, is over there on the map, uh, East Africa. Um, and they're delighted because uh, they've been waiting for rain for a long, long time, and, and they've got some at last. Seems we've got some as well. Ooh, back there. Um, so uh, praise also for lots of incoming staff. And as Chris and Sarah are planning to go to uh, serve at another school in uh, southern, southwestern uh, Germany, uh, Black Forest Academy, it's particularly important that new staff uh, come in to fill in the gaps. But uh, there's great news uh, these past couple of weeks. Uh, they, they try to disciple some of these pupils in the school and uh, show them more about the Lord Jesus from the Bible. And one young lady called Callie uh, has become a Christian. Uh, so she's a, a new sister uh, down in Kenya. Isn't that wonderful? Um, and um, we can pray that Chris and Sarah would have a lovely break uh, over Christmas um, because uh, they're going to get to visit the Simbeyes. That's Martin and Carolyn. Um, we often pray for Vinjeru School uh, over in Zambia. Well, finally, Chris and Sarah will get the chance to visit them uh, in their last Christmas in Africa, potentially. 
but it's been five and a half years since they've been able to see that other part of the family. So um, now we can gather in small groups. Are you happy to pray? If you're not happy to pray with the person next to you, that's fine. Just close your eyes and pray through these things. But uh, why not turn in groups of two or three and pray for Chris and Sarah Power, our missionaries in Kenya. Let's pray for a couple of minutes. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you are working here and in our city and internationally too. We thank you for those like Callie who have come to a living faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that many more would hear that gospel and receive Jesus as Lord and Saviour in Rift Valley Academy. Please provide teachers and staff, and we thank you for the gift of rain too. Thank you that the local farmers will be able to provide produce. Lord, you're so gracious in all your different gifts, and we pray that you provide for Chris and Sarah as they prepare to go to Black Forest Academy next summer. Help them in all their preparations, we pray. Amen. Well, let's encourage one another as uh, we put one foot in front of the other. Take the next step in life. Come, weary traveller. Fix your hope upon your journey's end. There is a glorious goal that we're work not working towards. Jesus has done all the work for us. We're walking towards this glorious goal that Jesus has secured for us. Let's stand and encourage one another. Come, weary traveller. <laughs>
Do please take a seat. Well, there's lots of ways we can encourage one another as we journey onwards. And uh, one of those ways is uh, men will gather not just for a men's breakfast once a month, but also for a coffee morning. That's the last Tuesday in every month, 10.30 at Darnelm, uh, the cafe there. Um, and where is, is Martin here today? There you are. Yeah, good. Apparently you're here. Yeah. So uh, if you've not um, been to that before, um, you're wondering what it's about, we'll just chat to Martin. It's a lovely time for socialising together if you happen to be available Tuesday at 10.30. Um, this Saturday, um, end of November, we've got a work party. If you're able to help Natalie get her house ready uh, to sell, uh, maybe you'd be able to help clean or paint or tidy. Natalie, could you give us a wave? So do see Natalie if you're able to help. She'd love to um, put your name down just to make sure she's got enough sandwiches because uh, they will be available, um, well, lunchtime, obviously. Um, a couple of other things coming up, a church members meeting Tuesday week, uh, the 3rd of December at 8 o'clock, if you're a church member, do encourage you to come along. We've got three people who've applied for baptism, so we're going to hear their testimonies. It's going to be great to um, encourage one another with what else is happening in church life as well, and pray for all God's work among us. Uh, another thing looking further ahead in December, goodness, we're mentioning Christmas now, um, some people will be alone on Christmas Day, um, so please do see me or Russell if you might be able to share a Christmas lunch with a church member. That would be very welcome indeed. One other thing, uh, last week we had three visitors uh, who volunteer for the rail pastors. They're a bit like street pastors, reaching out to those uh, uh, who are down and out, but rail pastors reach out to those at train stations. Stevenage is a particular trouble spot. Uh, for those who take their lives. Um, so Christians have been patrolling uh, lots of different stations across the UK, and they've got a particular heart at the moment uh, to branch out in Stevenage. If you would like uh, to find out what they do, well, they're going to be uh, on uh, Stevenage platform uh, uh, Wednesday the 4th. Uh, they're going to be there between 7 and 9, but I suggest we'll kind of meet them in the middle of their shift once they've settled in. Um, or, if that's not a convenient time, maybe Thursday the 12th of December uh, in the evening as well. If you're interested in finding out what they do, if you want to pray for them, uh, then do uh, let me know. Because they do a wonderful ministry, not only looking out for those who are distressed, but generally um, raising awareness of Christ amongst those who are travelling on the railways. And that's uh, valuable not just for passengers, passengers, but also for staff members. Well, let's pray now, shall we? Lord, uh, we thank you so much for those who care for the lonely and those in distress. We pray that you would equip them to share the love of Christ. Lord, we also pray for our nation to care for those in distress, as the assisted dying bill is coming up very soon. Please may our nation not sleepwalk into an age of putting people down, but rather may they redouble their efforts to support the vulnerable and value every life you've given. So please help us to convince even more MPs that we must oppose this change in the law and protect the weak and the dying. But Lord, we thank you so much that you are full of love throughout our lives. We thank you so much that you love us from the first breath. We pray for our young ones now. Please help them and their teachers to experience your truth and compassion more deeply as they go to their groups. Amen. Okay, uh, time now for the children to head out to their groups, all the way from creche to year eight. As they do, uh, why not say hello to those around you, if you haven't already, say good morning. It's okay. <laughs> what, what are we talking about? <laughs> Freedom. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs>
We're going to continue uh, in a short time of prayer now. I've asked Frida if she would lead us in prayer. Let's bow our heads. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this gathering. As we come together to worship you, may we bring glory and honor to your name. As your word tells us in Matthew 18.20, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am with them. Let every word that is preached here today reach our hearts, O God. Prepare our hearts to receive your word with humility and thankfulness, Lord. We pray for our leaders. We thank you for their obedience and sacrifice. May they continue to experience your grace as they share your, uh, your precious word with us, Lord. We also want to remember uh, those who are struggling in our church family. Draw them closer to you, Lord Jesus. May they experience your love, your comfort, and peace. We pray for patience and for joy for Roger and Sheila, Amanda and Sarah, and for Ron and Rita. Be with every member of this congregation, Lord. We pray that we make the most of every opportunity to make Jesus known. As you have saved us with the precious blood of Jesus, help us to be witnesses amongst our families, our friends, our neighbors, and colleagues. We pray for the same for our children in school and for those at university. We pray for John in Madeira and Heather and Cliff in Australia. We pray that we continue to glorify you wherever we are, O oh God. Even as you start this new week, O oh God, we ask for your guidance, your protection, your wisdom. We thank you, and as we pray these things, we believe in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Well, as we prepare to listen to the word of God, let's stand and encourage one another. Come, let us praise the Lord. Let's stand. for the certainty of that promise that one day perfect rest lies ahead. And so we pray that in the light of that, you might help us to listen to your word now, that we might know how to live in the meantime as we await your return, sure and certain of your love for us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Can you please take a seat.
If you, um, if you look out across the, the worldwide church, both um, geographically today and down through history, um, you will see a myriad of different ways of doing things. It doesn't all look like Long Meadow. Different styles of worship, different organizational structures, different building designs. And partly that reflects the huge diversity that there is in humanity. We have different cultures and personalities and ways of expression and likes and dislikes in terms of, of music and architecture and so on. It would be a surprise if the whole, if the church worldwide all looked the same, wouldn't it? And we need to be careful as we look at things uh, that are around us, not to assume that because we prefer this particular way of doing things, that other styles and approaches are not helpful too, or that ours are not flawed in any way. One of the striking things about the New Testament is how little prescriptive direction there is for what a church should look like as it gathers. Diversity is good, and we have much to learn from and appreciate in other traditions that are different to our own. But that doesn't mean that everything that takes place under the umbrella of church is helpful. The writer to the Hebrews is reminded, has been reminding his readers, who come, of course, from a Jewish background, how much better is the new covenant under Christ than the old covenant before. He is seeking to warn them for, against drifting back to old covenant practices, things which may feel familiar and perhaps comforting things which may feel steeped in, in spiritual significance and so therefore surely cannot be abandoned, things which appear to have the label of, of worthy and, and godly and committed and serious about faith. And yet actually we've been learning carry a great danger for their walk with the Lord. In our passage today in uh, Hebrews chapter 9, page 1206, if you're using one of the church Bibles, uh, in Hebrews chapter 9, we're going to see our, raw, our writer draw some contrast between the, the new covenant and the old. And as we do that, we're going to see some warnings, some, some red flags, if you like, about religious practices that we can apply to our thinking today. So let's listen to the opening verses of Hebrews chapter 9, page 1206. Now the first covenant had regulations for worship and also an earthly sanctuary. A tabernacle was set up. In its first room with a lampstand and a table with its consecrated bread, this was called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a room called the most holy place, which had the golden altar of incense and the gold-covered ark of the covenant. This ark contained the gold jar of manna, Aaron's staff that had budded, and the stone tablets of the covenant. Above the ark were the cherubim of the glory, overshadowing the, uh, the atonement cover, uh, but we cannot discuss those things in detail now. When everything had been arranged like this, the priests entered regularly into the outer room to carry on their ministry. But only the high priest entered the inner room, and that only once a year, and never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins the people had committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still functioning. This is an illustration for the present time, indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being off offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshipper. They are only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings. External regulations apply until the time of the new order. So you'll remember that at the end of the previous chapter, you can glance back up at chapter 8 and verse 13, the, the old covenant there was declared to be obsolete with the coming of Christ. But that doesn't mean that our writer is dismissive of what it continu can continue to teach us. So that description that he gave us there in verses 1 to 5 of the, the earthly tabernacle doesn't diminish it in any way, does it? Rather, as you read through that description, it sounds like a very impressive place, both for, for how it looked with all that, that gold stuff in there and for what it contained, those significant things from Israel's history. And there's that tantalizing comment, isn't there, at the end of verse 5. But we cannot discuss these things in detail now. And some of us are thinking, oh, no, go on. 
there's evidently more that can be learned about what these things symbolized and what we can learn from them. But our writer doesn't want us to get distracted from his main point. And his main point is this, the new covenant is better. The new covenant is better. And so what he emphasizes instead in this description here are the limitations, indeed, the frustrations of the old covenant. So firstly, we're told it's an earthly sanctuary. And as such, it is but a copy of the place where God truly dwells in all his glory. Secondly, its impressive design actually communicates distance from God, separation rather than intimacy, doesn't it? We're told here about two curtained off areas. The holy place, where sacrifices were made regularly by the priests, and the most holy place, where the Lord himself dwelt, where only the high priest went, and only once a year. So actually we discover that those beautiful things that he describes in the temple, like uh, the Ark of the Covenant, were never actually seen by the, the vast majority of the people of Israel. They were hidden behind curtains. And the most impressive thing of all, that Ark, was only ever seen by one man once a year. See, the tabernacle kept, the people were kept at a distance from God for their own safety. And as we've hinted already, at the same time, we're also reminded of limited access to God. Only some are able to get even close to the presence of God. Those priests who are going in and out of the outer room to carry out their service, remember that word, their service, uh, their ministry of, of sacrifice and offerings, and only one, the high priest, once a year on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, goes into the Holy of Holies. Limited access, and only to a few. So that, in verse 8, we're told the Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way into the most holy place where God dwelt had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still functioning. And why was this, were there this ongoing distance and restrictions of access? Well, he goes on to tell us in verse 9, this is an illustration for the present time indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshipper. In other words, because the sacrificial system of the Old Covenant was, was symbolic, it did not actually deal with sin. Well, how could it? It was only the blood of goats and calves, so it did not cleanse the conscience of the worshipper. Their sin remained waiting for God to deal with it one day as he had promised. Until that point, there was the need for distance and curtains to separate God off. So do you see how all this old covenant practice and symbolism carried the promise of so much? The promise of God's presence amongst his people and his purity for, for external purity and cleansing, and yet at the same time it would leave the worshipper frustrated, wouldn't it? It promised more, but it could not deliver. It pointed forward to a better covenant to come. It set the stage for a better rescue. Which leads us to the verses that follow, picking up at verse 11. But when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands, that is to say, is not part of this creation. And he did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death, so that we may serve the living God? Did you notice through those verses how this description of the new covenant deals with those frustrations and limitations that we saw in the old covenant? 
So firstly, Jesus goes through the true tabernacle, not some earthly copy. He goes right into the presence of God himself. And he does so not by sacrifices that could only ever be symbolic because they were of goats and calves, but by his own blood, so obtaining eternal redemption. So that the result of this, end of verse 14, is that we may serve the living God. An activity no longer restricted to a, a few priests who served before the altar, but now open to all who believe. There is no longer a hierarchy of access to God. And central to all this is what Jesus has achieved, verse 14. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God? Jesus' sacrifice in our place actually achieves something. It deals with sin so that consciences are cleansed, so that sin is ended, so because judgment has fallen on it in Christ, and so it has not fallen, and it cannot fall on us. So because sin is dealt with and is punished and is, dealt and is, is, uh, is taken away, there is no longer, therefore, any need for curtains or restrictions to keep God's people safe because God's people have been made holy. Their sin has been taken away and replaced by the righteousness of Christ. So now they, we, are free to approach God the Father himself. Jesus, our forerunner. Remember chapter 6 and verse 20? Jesus, our forerunner, has entered the curtain, behind the curtain, on our behalf, and where the forerunner has gone we can follow. So, given that we are not, major the major vast majority of us, not first century Jewish Christians, tempted to return to old covenant practices, what relevance does this comparison have for us today? Well, firstly, and most obviously, it's another wonderful reminder of all that we have in Christ, cleansed consciences so that we can approach and serve the living God. But secondly, it also throws up some red flags about religious life that we might encounter within the church, I think. Let me point us to three this morning. Firstly, our author has emphasised the new freedom of access that we have right into the presence of God. The curtains are gone. Therefore, any practice that suggests a distance from God, whether that be by architecture, or by the tone of a service, or an attitude, it should be a red flag. It is denying what the new covenant in Jesus' blood has achieved. We have full and complete access to God. Now, don't hear me wrongly here. There is a difference between evoking a right sense of awe and wonder at the majesty of ho and holiness of God, so that we fall on our knees in worship and adoration seeing how much bigger and more powerful and more good that he, than he is than us. That he is God and that we are not. There is a difference between that, which is good, and giving the impression that he is in some way out of reach and distant and removed. See, the wonders of the new covenant is that this awesome God has invited us to come near to him that we are no longer kept at a safe, respectful distance. Quite the reverse. Secondly, our author has shown us that the priestly ministry of the few on behalf of the many is ended. Christ is now our great high priest, and he has removed the curtain so that all may go in. So any practice that suggests a hierarchy of access to God, whether that be priest or pastor, uh, worship leader or prayer warrior, is denying what the new covenant in Jesus' blood has achieved. All of us, without exception, have entry into the throne room of God. So the prayers of a pastor or of an older Christian are no more effective or listened to than anyone else's are. There is no inside track for the really holy, as if there were such a category. 
We read last week in chapter 8 and verse 11, as our writer quoted from Jeremiah 31, no longer will they teach their neighbour or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. See, the wonder of the new covenant is complete equality of access to God himself. And thirdly, we've seen that under the new covenant, sin has finally been dealt with. Our consciences have been cleansed. We are freed from guilt. So therefore, any practice that leaves you with a lingering sense of guilt or fear the threat of God's rejection if you don't toe the line, the expectation that you should essentially feel bad about yourself because of your failings, even the motivation to serve or to live differently because you owe God for what he has done for you, guilt can be used in any number of different ways. The ongoing expectation or encouragement of guilt denies what the new covenant in Jesus' blood has achieved. Our consciences are washed clean. There's a difference between a right conviction of sin, which dismays us to the very depths of our hearts, and the cultivation of ongoing guilt that leaves us feeling unworthy or insecure and constantly looking over our shoulder for fear of God's disapproval. Godly conviction of sin dismays us, yes. But godly conviction of sin leads us to repentance, and repentance leads us to joy. Because we see once again that our sin has been atoned for in Christ. And we rejoice and we wonder once more at his grace. See, the cultivation of guilt may seem to have a, a humble recognition of our failings, but actually it denies the power and the glory of the gospel. Worse, it it distorts our view of God. It changes him from being a lovingly heavenly father who delights not only to forgive, but to restore and to change. And it turns him instead into a, a forbidding head taskmaster who is always waiting for our failures and inclined to inclined before long just to give up on us. And that results in a miserable, joyless existence in contrast to the life and the joy and the relationship that the gospel actually offers. See, the good news of the new covenant is that it never leaves you feeling guilty. The good news of the new covenant is that it never leaves you feeling guilty. Because unlike the old covenant, the new has actually dealt with the source of that guilt. Our sin and its consequences have been transferred to another and he has paid the price for it. It is done. It is over. And so there is no longer actually anything for us to feel guilty about because Jesus has dealt with it. For this reason, verse 15, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. In many ways, this is the hinge verse of the whole chapter, the summary of what Jesus has achieved. For this reason, because he has entered the presence of God by his blood, he has begun and now mediates the new covenant. He has brought an eternal inheritance, the promise of being with God and enjoying him forever because he's dealt with the problem of sin and we are set free from the guilt and the penalty of that sin. And our writer is going to take the second half of this chapter, which we'll look at um, in less, uh, more briefly, to show us why it had to be this way, why Jesus' death was necessary. Both what we've read already and what we're about to read has repeated use of the word blood there. And I suspect as we hear that word repeated again and again, it can sometimes make us feel a little bit uncomfortable. It, it's just a bit graphic, isn't it? It's a bit visceral. Perhaps sometimes as we hear that word repeated again and again, it can make us wince and cringe a bit. The phrase, the phrase Jesus died for our sins can 
can trip off our tongues very easily. But in reality, it's a gruesome idea that we're talking about here. And often we've sanitized an object of terrible execution, the cross, into a pretty chain that we wear around our necks. But the cross is about blood being spilled. Is there not some other way? A cleaner, more genteel way? We'll have a listen to the rest, the next verses of Hebrews chapter 9, picking up at verse 16. In the case of a will, it is necessary to prove the death of the one who made it, because a will is only in force when somebody has died. It never takes effect while the one who has made it is living. This is why even the first covenant was not put into effect without blood. When Moses had proclaimed every command of the law to all the people, he took the blood of the calves together with water, scarlet wool and branches of hyssop, and sprinkled the scroll and all the people. He said, this is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you to keep. In the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tabernacle and everything used in its ceremonies. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Now, there's actually a play on words in the Hebrew in verses 16 to 18, but you'd already spotted that, of course. The same word that is used for covenant is also used for will, or legacy. So our author is using a will as an illustration here, a very simple illustration, essentially to say this, death is necessary. A will doesn't come into effect without a death. There is no legacy unless someone dies. And the same is true of the covenant, he said. Death is necessary for it to come into effect. Actually, the old covenant had taught this very clearly. Verse 18, even the first covenant was not put into effect without blood. Even the the outward cleansing and purification which the old covenant did bring, see verse 10, required the shedding of blood. And the the centrality of the, the sacrificial system with its daily slaughtering of goats and calves drove that reality home. But why? Why all this gruesome stuff? Well, because of what we're always inclined to forget, I think. Because of the seriousness of sin. That's what lies at the heart of verse 22. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Sin matters. It is horrible and it is revolting. Now, we know that on one level, don't we? When we see and hear things on our news, the uh, the abuse of the vulnerable, the, the manipulation of the weak, the Corruption which takes from those most in need. Mistreatment and rejection based on the the colour of someone's skin or their gender or their their sexual orientation or their disability. Sin is horrific. But underlying all those things from which we rightly recoil and which make us justly angry lies the primary problem of us as humanity. Those things are actually merely symptoms The problem is our rejection of God and his goodness. That we take the things that he gives, life and breath and friends and family and food and entertainment and beauty to look at and experiences that exhilarate us, and we ignore the giver. Actually, worse than that, we worship things other than him. We place ourselves at the centre of the universe where he deserves to be. We go against all that is true and good and right. We set ourselves up against him. We defy him. Sin is serious. When we begin to see who it's against, and evil must be dealt with. But God does not draw a line under the really serious stuff and excuse the, the rest. After all, where would that line come anyway? perhaps just above where we've reached. And if he did draw such a line, how could he then claim to be good and just? All wrongdoing, all sin matters, and all sin matters because it is in defiance of the good God who's there. I'm sure many of you will know that the musical Wicked is coming to the big screen very soon. It tells the story of the Wicked Witch of the the West from The Wizard of Oz, and what led her to be that way. It's actually the, the, first, uh, the latest in a number of films to give a, a backstory to, to a famous villain and so to explain their behaviour. 
Uh, Maleficent was another example, which tells the story of the, the evil fairy from Sleeping Beauty and why she turned out the way she did. They make for interesting stories and often for good movies, but uh, I wonder actually if they hide a, a deeper attitude too. That if we can give enough of a backstory to these, these things, we can begin to show that, well, their wickedness was not actually their fault, really, was it? That they were in some way victims of the world in which they lived and how it impacted them. In other words, their sin was not really their fault, was it? And if that's true of Disney villains, well, of course, it can be true of us too, can't it? I become a victim, not a perpetrator. I am not actually accountable for what I've done. How often do I make excuses for my behaviour or my words or my attitudes? I was tired. I was frustrated. I was provoked. I have an excuse. I'm not responsible. Now, I'm, I'm not denying that what happens to us, circumstances and experiences and relationships, don't shape who we are. They do. And they do shape, to some extent, how we behave and how we react. But those things are reasons. They're not excuses. The responsibility for what we say and do, for the attitudes we display, remain ours. They remain mine. And it matters. It matters before a good and holy God. See, the Old Covenant reminded Israel of the seriousness of their sin. It taught them that day after day after day that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness but it also wonderfully pointed forward to what was to come. Verse 23. It was necessary then for the copies of the... If it was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices, but the heavenly things themselves were better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again, the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But he has appeared once for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Here's again is, is the good news that we've already heard today. Repeated once again, lest we, we forget or we doubt or we wonder. As verse 15 told us, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, that those who are, who are called may receive the promised inheritance. Now that he has died, his blood has been shed as a ransom to set them free from their sins, to cleanse their consciences. So again, we're told Jesus enters the reality of God's presence, not an earthly uh, copy, but he does so as our great high priest. Verse 26, to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. His blood washes us clean. So that when he appears a second time, as he will, to wrap up history and to bring final judgment on all wickedness and evil, we who have trusted in him have nothing to fear. Nothing to fear. Because he brings final salvation to those who are waiting. The fullness of all that promised inheritance, being ushered into the very presence of God to enjoy him forever. See, the seriousness of sin is matched by the sufficiency of the sacrifice. The seriousness of sin is matched by the sufficiency of the sacrifice, and so God fulfills all that he has promised us. And he does so in Christ. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you again for the wonder of the gospel. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have entered the true sanctuary and that you've done so by your blood which was shed so that our sin might indeed be forgiven, so that you might take it away, that we might no longer have to bear its burden, its consequences, or its guilt. 
Thank you for the wonder of free and full access to the Father through you. Thank you that we don't need anyone else to speak for us on our behalf, that the Father welcomes us into his very presence. Please help us to remember these things, to rejoice in these things, to live in the light of the glory of this new covenant, and so to share this great good news with others around, as confident, joyful people, because you have redeemed and ransomed us. And so we can look forward to your one-day return without any fear, because then you will bring salvation as we wait for you. Lord, we ask that these truths might sink deep into our hearts and minds and shape who we are and how we act and how we speak and how we think to the glory of your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing a song which reminds us of exactly where our confidence lies and the wonder that we should be able to boldly approach the throne of grace to claim a crown which has been given to us. Let's stand and sing and celebrate the wonder of the new covenant. <laughs>
you for the glory of the new covenant. Thank you for all that you have done for us. Help us to bask in its wonder and eternally praise you for what you have given us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Please take a seat.